Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of December 30th, 2024, this time around. So mostly, it's the first week of 2025. I hope 2024 was a great year for you. I hope you have a chance to look back at it and think about fabulous things that happened, and, and, and that 2025 is going to be even better. So uh, it seems like every time we do these, it's, every time we do these uh, nowadays, it seems like it's a huge week with lots of stuff going on, and this is no exception. So we, got, we better jump right into it, or else you know, we'll be 25 minutes later, and I'll still be here jabbering about this stuff, which would be great, but you know, we probably ought to keep moving. So let's start with the Quadrantids uh, meteor shower. The Quadrantids are, um, they're named, remember, You've got, the, you've got the, the, the radiant in a meteor shower where the meteors seem to come from that point, and they're named for the constellation of where that radiant lies. And you're thinking, well, I don't know what quadrant, quad, quadranted, a quadrant, a quadrant, um, and, and, and we don't anymore. Uh, it's, a, it's a constellation we don't use much anymore. Quadrants Moralis is uh, the home of the radiant of this meteor shower. And this meteor shower... Uh, the radiant lies above Hercules, uh, near Draco, toward the Big Dipper. So looking north, basically. And remember, you don't have to look right at the radiant to see the meteors. They can be way across the sky, uh, where the Earth has intercepted that debris. And you see the streak, but the streak would trace back to this, this uh, radiant. Now, if you've heard me talk about meteor showers before, I like to think about a big tube of material, a big tunnel of material that the Earth crashes through. And as it crashes through there, it's got... Um, we're intercepting all this debris and we see all of these meteors come flying in. And, and so you get this much longer uh, time of, of enhanced meteor activity than most people tend to think about. Uh, but that's not the case as much here. Uh, these meteors have a very narrow tube that we crash through and a very narrow window of peak activity. Uh, and so your best bet is to really be out on the morning of January 3rd, just before dawn. Uh, and that's when you have your best chance of releasing. But there could be quite a few meteors. This could be a pretty active, nice meteor shower. No moon around at that time. So if you can, if you can get out there uh, just before it starts to get light on the morning of the 3rd and, and, and check this out, see if you might see some good meteors. This might be one of the better meteor showers of the year uh, to start this thing off. So let, let, give that a try. Uh, on the 4th at, in the morning, uh, 7.30 my time, uh, Central, Central Standard Time, air in the middle of the United States, uh, we are at perihelion passage. We're as close to the sun as we get, which means we're moving as fast in our orbit as we get. And, and so here we are. We've done this before. There's the sun. Uh, we've drawn a monument to point directly up at the sun, right? And one orbit later, that monument isn't pointed. One, one rotation, excuse me. One, uh, uh, <laughs> one Earth rotation later, uh, that, that monument's no longer pointed at the sun. We have to over-rotate a little bit to get back and point it at the sun. And so now that we're moving faster than average in our orbit, because we're so close to the sun, we go further in our orbit, we have to rotate more. It takes longer to get back to having the sun directly overhead. Everything is later than we would expect it to be, including sunsets and sunrises. So if you've been paying attention, we are now approaching about a month that we've been getting later sunsets, and now's a wonderful time to go out and check it out every night. Go out and check out every night, and you see... Uh, the daylight increasing on the evening side relatively rapidly. Not, not like it's going to be, uh, but it's noticeable now. Uh, but we've still been losing daylight on the morning side until just about the beginning of this week. And then we can start to gain it on the morning side as well. And that's because everything was coming later than we would have expected if we'd been moving at a uniform speed in our orbit. So we had just had more rotation to do. So that's something to look at. That's something to think about. We got that on January 4th. We've been watching Venus approach Saturn in the evening sky. So you, got, you see Venus in the evening sky, biggest, brightest, beautiful object uh, just after sunset right there. You swing over to the east and you're going to see a bright dot that is Saturn. And you can watch Venus close on that. This week, it's amazing. It starts 18 degrees. Remember, your fist at arm's length is about 10 degrees. It starts almost two fist uh, widths away from Saturn, the separation between them, and it's closed down to almost one. It goes from 18 degrees to 12 degrees over the course of this week. So Venus is flying towards Saturn. Fun to watch. Fun to watch. Next week and the week after that going to be even more fun. So it's going to be great. Let's keep an eye on that. On the second in the evening, as you're looking at Venus, 
Venus passes Iota Aquarii, okay? It gets within about one degree, about a finger width at arm's length of Iota Aquarii. And on this evening, about uh, 10 degrees off to the west, is a 10% full crescent moon, a nice, beautiful, thin crescent moon. Uh, so this is a, a beautiful thing to see on that evening. Uh, Iota Aquarii is a 4.3 magnitude star. You got dark skies, no problem. You see it. Uh, no problem at all. If you've got a little bit of light pollution, it can be a problem, uh, and you might need binoculars to help you see that object. It's a B-type star. We make a graph of how bright a star is, luminosity, uh, how much energy per time it's emitting as a function of temperature, temperature increasing across that way. Uh, and, and, and the main sequence of stars that are fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores, that's where they're getting most of their energy production, hydrogen to helium fusion in the core, looks like this. And we classify these stars as O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. M, K, and M stars are low mass, low, low luminosity, not very, not very intense stars. O and B stars, big, bright, intense stars, and they don't live very long because they're burning their fuel so rapidly. And this is a B star, so this is a pretty bright star way up there that we see. It's not one of the brighter stars in the sky, so it's not hugely... Uh, that tells you it's not right on top of us. It has to be a little ways away. So we think about that as the, the as Venus slides by Iota Aquarii uh, with the moon, 10% full crescent moon, about 10 degrees away. Next night, the moon will pass by Venus. By the time it gets dark for me, again, here in the middle of the United States, this 15 to 20% full moon uh, will be three, four, five degrees away from Venus. Uh, so those of you who live east of where I am, uh, the, and that means, you know, probably better in Europe, uh, to be able to see uh, Venus and the moon much, much closer together. The next thing, same thing plays out the next night. By the time it gets dark for me, uh, the 25 to 30 percent full moon on the evening of the 4th will be just a few degrees from Saturn. And so just as, as, you, as you're thinking about Venus catching Saturn, watch the moon do that same sort of thing here as the moon slides from Venus to Saturn, the 3rd to the 4th. But by the time it gets dark for me, um, the moon will have already passed Saturn and will be a few degrees away. Uh, if you live east of where I am, again, well east of where I am, uh, probably in Europe or, or, or on across into Central Europe and Asia even, uh, and, 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 and Africa, uh, would be a great place uh, to see uh, the moon closer to Saturn than, than where I'll get a chance to see it. Uh, Jupiter, uh, big bright Jupiter comes up in the east every night. By the, now, by the time it gets dark, Jupiter's up pretty high in, in the east. You look over that direction, it's probably the biggest, brightest thing you're going to see. And Jupiter's sitting right below Tau Tauri. And a star in Taurus, Jupiter's in Taurus, and you'll see that it's very close to Tau Tauri this week. Interesting for us, because it's a 4.3 magnitude star, just like Iota Aquarii was. And it's also a B star, just like Iota Aquarii was. So not a lot of B stars out there. Uh, they're not rare, uh, but there's a lot more of all of these other classifications. Those stars are pretty rare. Um, but these A, F, G, K, and M stars are pretty common relative. Uh, we don't see these stars down here as much because they're faint. You can't see them very far away. But we see a lot of A and F stars out there when we, when we count up the stars we see in the sky. Uh, lots of A and F stars. B stars are bright, so we can see them very far away. So we see a lot of them. Uh, you know, we see a, a large fraction of them uh, that are out there, but there aren't as nearly as many of them. They just don't, they're harder to make and they don't live as long. And so these, uh, to have two B stars, uh, one next to Jupiter and one next to Venus this week, just, just fun, just absolutely fun to think about. And that they're both 4.3 magnitude means they must be about the same distance from us. Uh, so they're both about the same distance, not in the same direction, uh, but so, so interesting stuff. Now, it has a companion that's about two-tenths of an arc second away from it. Uh, an arc minute is a sixtieth of a degree. Uh, an arc second is a sixtieth of an arc minute. So there's no way we're pulling that out with our telescopes. It's just not going to do it. Uh, it's got a 58-year orbit, but it's part of a binary system. And the primary star, the 4.3 magnitude star in that system, is a spectroscopic binary. And we've talked about spectroscopic binaries a few times uh, this winter. And so we look at the spectra of the stars, and we see 
as a, as a star comes towards us, that's the spectral lines, the dark lines in the spectrum uh, are blue shifted, and the star moves away, it's red shifted. That means we get shorter wavelength, longer wavelength. But we know there's two stars here because we see two sets of lines, one simultaneously blue shifted and one red shifted, and every three days it completes an orbit like this. And so we see uh, one star coming toward us, one star moving away from us, and it switches. One star coming toward us, one moving away from us, switches, switches. And so we see that orbit in this spectroscopic binary. Uh, Jupiter lies right on a line, more or less, with M45, the Pleiades, about 14 degrees over to the Pleiades. Pleiades are great. Uh, enjoy them with your binoculars. They're too big. It's too spread out to, to really get a good telescopic view. Uh, you can see it with your naked eye. Uh, no problem at all if you've got anything at all like dark skies. And so that's about a fist and a half over there. You go the other direction, about 11 and two-thirds degrees, about a fist over the other direction, and you've got the Crab Nebula, M1. And the Crab Nebula is this supernova remnant of a star that blew up in the year 1054. And so we have this star that exploded almost a thousand years ago, and we can see the remnant, the, 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 what's left over of this expanding gas uh, of this star that exploded this, this nearly a thousand years ago. And you got to have a telescope for that. Uh, for sure, you got to have a telescope, and you got to work at it a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit of a low surface brightness object like we talked about last week. And um, it's, maybe we talked about it, I don't know. I've talked about it with somebody somewhere, sometime. And so you've got, but it, it looks like a little smudge of light. It's one of those things, you see pictures of it. Go out and look at pictures on the web, and you're like, whoa, that's fantastic. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And then you see it in the eyepiece of a telescope, you're like, um, and so people say that to me all the time. They'll say, well, you know, it's just not that impressive in the eyepiece. It, it, you don't see the color. You don't see the structure as much. You see a little bit of shape to it. It's actually interesting that way. Um, but you don't see the, the, the knots of the exploding gas so much. And so it's a, it can be disappointing. But when you think about what you're looking at, a star that blew up a thousand years ago, it, it's really, really uh, something special. So this is a good week. We don't have much moon, so you can enjoy these sorts of things this week. So we got a lot of stuff for you to look at. Uh, as always, everybody, thanks for watching, and we hope you have a great week ahead.